Tom, uh, with his title, Seeing Through the Fog, is really going to address a number of issues and perhaps questions that you have. And so I'm going to turn it over to him right away. Right. Tom, thanks for coming. Thank you. OK, well, good afternoon. So I have a lot that I hope to cover today. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, for those of you who might be new to e-cigarettes, let me take a few minutes to tell you what they are, describe uh, a little bit about them. Uh, everyone okay? So, so e-cigarettes are these battery-powered devices that are designed to mimic a cigarette. And uh, they were originally invented in China uh, by a pharmacist, and they were designed as a smoking cessation aid. Um, and they come in a variety of designs. They were originally designed to look like a, a, a cigarette. Um, they came to the market in 2004, but over time they've evolved. They uh, tend to look less and less like a cigarette, and more and more, um, these days, in fact, they can look like pretty much anything. Uh, this is a vape pen over on the right side. Um, but regardless of what they look like, they all work on the same principle. They all contain a, a liquid that's stored either in a tank or soaked into some absorbent material. And that liquid is then wicked into a heating element and that heating element vaporizes the liquid. That heating element is controlled by a battery that the user can activate either by puffing the cigarette or by pressing a button. So what is that liquid that gets vaporized? Well, it's primarily a combination of propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. Um, these are viscous materials that produce the actual vapor uh, and carry the other ingredients. Propylene glycol is also typically in fog machines, so it's a similar style and consistency of vapor as what you would see in a fog machine. Also, typically, there's nicotine, usually in a concentration that would mimic or approximate that of a cigarette. But there doesn't have to be nicotine, and there can be more or less than what you would see in a cigarette. And then in addition to that, there's a seemingly limis, limitless assortment of flavorings. These can be virtually anything. They're typically things that are found in the food industry. Um, but they can be so many different things. And, and there are thousands of vape shops spread out across the country. Most of them tend to make their own liquids, so their own combinations of these flavoring ingredients. Uh, and, and so this example on the top right would be an example of what you might find in a specific vape shop. But there are thousands of these in pr virtually every strip mall in America. Um, and so there can be nearly limitless number of, of different products on the market. And while many of the ingredients have been tested and are considered acceptable for an ingestion, uh, most of them have not been tested for inhalation exposures and toxicology data can differ dramatically depending on the route of exposure. And there's some, several key examples of uh, that. So what's the big deal? So ever since e-cigarettes hit the market in 2004, they've been a lightning rod for controversy. And there are many public health institutions throughout the world, such as the World Health Organization, American Heart Association, Food and Drug Administration, who have all distanced themselves from e-cigarettes. They make claims such as, uh, at the top, rather than helping to get rid of tobacco forever, e-cigarettes could actually make smoking culturally acceptable again. Uh, several countries, at the urging of the World Health Organization, have banned e-cigarettes. Also, this statement here in the middle from the FDA kind of exemplifies the stance of many of these public health institutions, that we're concerned about the potential for addiction and abuse of these products. We don't want the public to perceive them as a safer alternative to cigarettes. But then this is contrasted by views such as this guy. So this is a politician. He made headlines a week ago. I hope this plays. Nope. That's OK. Uh, so I more or less memorized his speech. He, he, gave, a, uh, he gave a presentation during a, a committee meeting uh, talking about e-cigarettes in which he said this. Uh, uh, he pulled out his vaporizer, took a big puff, blew it out uh, to the laughter of everybody in the room and said, this is a vaporizer. There's no combustion. There's no carcinogens. Smoking has gone down as the use of vaporizers has gone up. There's no burning. There's nothing noxious about this whatsoever. This has helped thousands of people to quit smoking. 
It has helped me to quit smoking. In the next decade, you're going to be able to inhale ibuprofen, Prozac, et cetera. This is the future, and for freedom's sake, I urge you all to oppose this amendment. It was a pretty moving speech. And, uh, and then another guy stood up and said, as far as I know, this is just water vapor. What are we going to ban next? Uh, bad breath, moist hot air, uh, body odor. Uh, so you, know, you might argue that, that these are politicians. What do they know? But their views are largely supported by Public Health England. And Public Health England is the UK's leading health protection agency. And they state, uh, they released a report about six months ago in which they said best estimates show that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful to your health than normal cigarettes, and when supported by a smoking cessation service, help most smokers to quit tobacco altogether. There's no evidence so far that e-cigarettes are acting as a route into smoking for children or non-smokers. And so I found it kind of striking when you put these different quotes side by side. This is the you know, the leading public health agency for the US, the leading public health agency for the UK, they're seeing the same data and coming to polar opposite conclusions. So what are we, the general public, supposed to do when the experts can't uh, seem to, to agree? Well, in my case, I turned to the internet. And so, so I, as I was putting this talk together about a week ago, I started looking at different websites, and I came across this one that I thought was interesting. And this is the, the e-cigarette hoaxes, the things that they want you to, know, to think. They being the Darth Vaders, the, the FDA. Uh, they want you to think that e-cigarettes can explode, and that they contain antifreeze, carcinogens, that they're harmful to your lungs, that uh, they lure children and non-smokers, that they're as bad as tobacco. And, and I'll add some others that kind of piggybacking on the last slide, that, uh, that they're also a gateway to tobacco, that they'll undo decades worth of efforts to eliminate tobacco, and that they're not actually a smoking cessation aid. And so I thought that I would loosely frame my presentation around these quote unquote hoaxes and kind of provide a balanced view of both sides and, and try to point out where maybe there are hoaxes, maybe where there is a shred of, of truth behind some of these, in some cases more than a shred. I think that I've accomplished this in this presentation that, that I give a balanced take, but just as a conflict of interest, uh, just so you know I am who I am, I, uh, I published a study, I led a study here, which we published about a year ago, where I showed some negative effects of e-cig exposure. So I'll talk about that a bit, but. My goal is to present both sides and, and let you be the judge. So first, do e-cigarettes really lure in non-smokers and children? Well, there have been a handful of studies, surveys, that have tried to estimate what are the demographics of, of the e-cigarette user. Um, and they have ranged fairly dramatically. There, uh, the first study showed that about 12.6% of e-cig users are never smokers, and an additional 5.8% are people who have long since kicked their, their tobacco habit and are reintroduced to nicotine thanks to e-cigarettes. That's an American study. You'll see this kind of play out throughout where studies that come out of the US tend to be contradicted by studies that, are, that come out of the UK. Uh, a, a report that came out of, of the UK showed that it's actually a negligible percentage of e-cig users are never smokers, uh, less than 1%. We are wrapping up our own survey here, going into various Baltimore area vape shops, and we determined that roughly 6 to 8% of the users in those vape shops describe themselves as never smokers. So the question is, who is right? Well, I think probably they're all right. It just depends on who you ask and when you ask it and where you ask it. When it comes to e-cigarettes, demographics play a major role. These are certainly much more popular in younger individuals, more popular in men, more popular in whites than Hispanics, blacks, Asians. So it really depends. If, if, you, if you took a, a group of never smokers who were a group of 70-year-old Asian women, and ask them how many of you have tried an e-cigarette, the answer is going to be zero. But if you ask a bunch of never smokers who were 18-year-old white males, probably going to be a fairly high percentage. So it just depends. And also, this is, this is not a static market. This is a rapidly evolving market. If you ask that question five years ago, you're going to get a very different answer than what you get today. 
So sticking with 2014 statistics from the CDC, these are again in adults. If you look at uh, the, the overall adult population in the U.S., 12.6% of us have tried an e-cigarette, 3.7% of us are currently using an e-cigarette, and you can see the majority of those are current or recent former smokers. The number of never smokers who have tried an e-cigarette, pretty low, 3.2%, and only 0.4% of never smokers are currently using e-cigarettes. But if you crunch the numbers, which I tried to do here, what does that really equate to? Assuming there's 250 million adults in the U.S., current smoking rate is 16.8%. I took a guess at the number of former smokers. I think it's roughly 20%, but I could be wrong. Um, so that leaves probably about 5 million of us never smokers who have tried an e-cigarette, and maybe a half million to a million never smokers who are currently using an e-cigarette. So that's a reasonable population. Certainly, the advertising is not just limited to the cigarette smokers. The, the advertising is targeting the broader audience. This is a business, after all. They're selling a product. Uh, and so they use themes of sex and glamour and rebellion and independence and things that are not limited to smokers. In fact, they're not allowed to make claims that this is a smoking cessation aid. Uh, but what about children? Many people will argue that the wide array of flavors, the bright colors, those are all going to attract children. And certainly, if if you're a never smoker or you know, a teenager, you're much more likely to pick one of these up if it's cupcake flavored than if it's tobacco flavor. Um, and, but as, as far as advertising goes, we're, we're not at the level that we were with cigarette smoke when you go back, uh, this is a, from 25 years ago, where when you surveyed six-year-olds, Joe Camel was as recognizable as Mickey Mouse. We're not at that level. We don't have cartoon-themed uh, advertisements, but certainly the majority of teenagers report that they have been exposed to at least one form of e-cigarette advertising. Um, and while they're not directly targeted ch children, certainly their their ears are open and they're they're receiving the messages. Uh, but is it getting through? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is again another CDC report uh, on youth tobacco survey, and this is looking at all the different types of tobacco. For high schoolers on the top, middle schoolers in the bottom, uh, and this is looking at recent use within the past 30 days. What they show is that over the past four years, cigarette rates have been coming down for both high schoolers and middle schoolers. At the same time, e-cigarette rates have been increasing exponentially to the point where in 2014, for the first time, e-cigarettes are now the most popular tobacco product among both high schoolers and middle schoolers. About what, 14%, 13% of high schoolers and 3% of middle schoolers report using an e-cigarette within the past 30 days. So certainly this is reaching children, um, but these trends kind of cause you to ask a couple questions. One, is it true that as the congressman said, is, is one causing the other? Is this meteoric rise in e-cigarette popularity explaining the, uh, this decline in e-cigarette, or in cigarette smoking? And, and uh, is, are e-cigarettes actually hastening the decline of, of cigarette smoking? Or is it on the other hand? Are we saying, well, wait a second, we, we, this is, I just showed you a bunch of stats of, of middle schoolers and high schoolers who are now using e-cigarettes. This is the next generation of individuals who are now going to many of whom are going to become addicted to nicotine and become lifelong customers of nicotine. And many of those will possibly switch and eventually start smoking cigarettes as well. So both sides make some logical arguments, and I think both sides will be able to point to specific cases that support their argument. Uh, the question is, is, who wins out? And I don't know the answer to that. This is a, a report from the Harvest, Harvard Business Review that's now several years old. But they attempted to make some guesses at, um, uh, at, at the overall contributions of each and more or less came to the conclusion that they're, they're, they're somewhat offsetting each other. Um, and so I don't know what, what uh, is going to win out. And certainly if you look at the trends in smoking, they've been declining for decades. For 40 years, smoking rates have been declining. So to say that smoking is, is the result of that is a bit short-sighted. Um, you can see that they were declining for the seven-year period prior to e-cigarettes entering the market. And even though e-cigarette sales have doubled or tripled every year since, 
um, you know, I, it's hard to see any trends. There's more or less a straight line running through there. Um, so at least at this point, it's hard to say at the population level that there are any substantial effects that e-cigarettes have had on the market as a whole. But we can address the validity of each of those arguments. And so first, there are a few studies that have addressed the claims about e-cigarettes possibly being a gateway. And so the first two studies um, are cross-sectional surveys. One came from the National Adult Tobacco Survey, the second one from the National Youth Tobacco Survey. They more or less said the same thing. Uh, for example, if you take the top one, 4,000 never smoking young adults of whom 7.9% have tried an e-cigarette, that 7.9% report opinions to make them more open to cigarette smoking. Similar trends in adolescence, the strongest effects are seen among the youngest. But this is, these are just cross-sectional studies. There's no cause and effect, there's no sequence. Um, but there are a couple prospective studies that, that I'll point out, at least just this one, um, that came out maybe six months ago, where if you looked, this, this study looked at ninth graders, 2,500 ninth graders from the Los Angeles area, of whom, they were all never smokers, of whom 8.7% had reported trying an e-cigarette. Those, that 8.7% were more likely in the ensuing year to start either smoking cigarettes, cigars, or hookahs than the other non-smokers who had not reported any baseline uh, e-cigarette use. I should also point out that as I mentioned before, 3.2% of never smokers throughout the country have tried an e-cigarette. But when you look at younger adults, that's much higher. When you look at ninth graders, it's even higher. So again, demographics playing a big role. Um, another study in adults said more or less the same thing. Among never smokers who had expressed no interest in smoking at the time of enrollment, they were more likely to change their views over the course of a year. They were more likely to start smoking than those never smokers who had not tried an e-cigarette. But what about on the other side? Are they really a smoking cessation aid? And if you hold e-cigarettes up to the eye test, you would say logic would suggest yes, they look like a cigarette, at least they can. They deliver nicotine as effectively as a cigarette. Uh, they deliver it via the same route via the same pharmacokinetics. Unlike a patch, if you put the patch or the gum, it has a slow release of nicotine over time. If you take a puff of an e-cigarette, it delivers nicotine to your brain in seven seconds, just like a cigarette. So, you know, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. It's, it's gotta work at least as well as the patch or the gum, you would think. And several studies indeed say that, yes, if you give smokers e-cigarettes, it can reduce cigarette consumption, it can reduce cravings, also, two studies that are shown here on the left were among smokers who were looking to quit using an e-cigarette to quit. If the e-cigarette contained nicotine, they were twice as likely to quit than if the uh, smokers or the e-cigarettes did not contain nicotine. So all of these kind of point to some effect as a smoking cessation aid. But then a wrinkle to this came in just a month ago, if that, um, where this large meta-analysis was conducted in which they actually showed the opposite, that you're 28% less likely to quit if you use an e-cigarette. And I kind of struggled to understand this, and, and this study has been criticized, uh, particularly by people such as down here. These are studies that showed significant benefit from, from e-cigarettes. These are, by the way, UK studies. Um, but uh, so, What's the take on this? Uh, they looked at studies regardless of whether or not there was an explicit interest in quitting smoking, if that was the primary motivation for using an e-cigarette, or if what, they used both, whether or not they were, whether or not that was their primary interest. The studies at the bottom are the ones where the users were explicitly using e-cigarettes to quit. Um, and so what that showed it, is that there are some examples where you can be successful but then there were other examples where there was no benefit or even on the worse side. So in the end, there was no change if you looked at those studies where smoking, was, or smoking cessation was the primary intent. However, among the other studies where there wasn't an explicit intent to stop smoking, what they saw is that there was a significant reduction in 
the rates of quitting. So what this suggests, and here's my take on it, that if you make a smoking cessation attempt, if you attempt to quit, you're likely to be more successful with an e-cigarette. However, use of e-cigarettes discourages, discourages the number of quit attempts that the users make. And what the conclusions of this study is that you have a bit on both sides, and that is a net negative, that the minority of people use an e-cigarette for the sole intention to quit. So in, in the end, while you're more likely to, to be successful if you use them to quit, it, you're less likely to try to quit, and you're likely to try fewer times, fewer quit attempts. So that's kind of confusing, and I don't know if I 100% buy it, but, uh, uh, but that's where we are right now with, with, with that. So let me move on to, yeah. We have a question from the internet. Sure. e-cigarettes even as addictive as combustion cigarettes? Well, nicotine is the addictive element, and that is, that is there in comparable levels whether you're a, an e-cigarette user or a cigarette smoker. At least it can be. Um, as far as, remind me the first part of that question. Is it, is it a tobacco to product? Well, a it's a gray area. Tobacco. Yeah, uh, it, it doesn't contain tobacco, and uh, and so it's, it's really difficult, and I think that's part of the reason why the FDA has had such a tough time coming up with regulations. What do you actually regulate about it? If it's not quite tobacco, do you regulate nicotine? Do you regulate the device? Do you, what is it that you're regulating? Um, especially because you can make these liquids in your home. I've, I've made them in the lab. You can buy propylene glycol and nicotine and make them yourself. So what exactly are you regulating? Um, but there was an an act of 2009, the Family Tobacco Con uh, Control Act that Obama signed that gave the FDA deeming authority to regulate new and emerging products as tobacco. And so as far as the FDA is concerned, it is a tobacco product, even though it does not contain tobacco. And uh, they're likely, in the, I think they're in the very late stages of, of coming to final conclusions on their regulatory policies, but they are going to be regulated as a tobacco and how product. how about the question of, of addiction? Maybe you'll get to that, but. Uh, you know. I, I, I don't know if they're more or less addictive. All I can say is that nicotine is there in comparable levels, and, and so nicotine is what you get hooked on. Um, so I, I, my guess is that they're going to be as addictive as, mm -hmm. as Cigarettes. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so what's in them? Is, is, is there really carcinogens? Is there antifreeze? Uh, as far as antifreeze goes, I, I'll say uh, propylene glycol is considered an antifreeze. It'll effectively reduce the freezing temperature of water. It's used as a plain de-icer. It's used as an eco-friendly antifreeze. It's probably not the antifreeze that's in your car. That's probably ethylene glycol, which is more effective but also much more toxic. But uh, and, and in fact, ethylene glycol has been detected in trace levels in the liquids, probably as a contaminant of the propylene glycol manufacturing process. But as far as the other chemicals, now I know that there are a ton of studies looking at what chemicals are in e-cigarettes. And I only listed the ones that are vapors, uh, but it turns out that the vapors are very different than the liquids, and there are twice as many studies on the, on the liquids. And this is not an all-inclusive list, and I don't intend to go through all of these, but the take-home message of these is that no matter what, or most, I should say, of the toxic chemicals that are associated with toxicity in cigarette smoke, if you go and look for them in e-cigarette vapors, you tend to find them. It's not so much whether or not they're there, it's how much of it is there. These days, assays have such low limits of detection that you can detect virtually anything. So the question is, is how much is there? So the general consensus is that they're all there, although in reduced concentrations, such as 90% less, 98% less. It's these numbers where Public Health England derived their value of 95%. Um, 
because there really isn't enough human health data to come to any conclusion about, uh, certainly not of a firm number like 95%. And it also depends what your endpoint is, kind of digressing that if, if cancer is your endpoint, if COPD is your endpoint, if pneumonia is your endpoint, they're all going to have different relative uh, uh, toxicities. But so the take home is that they're all there, although in lower concentrations. That's not the case for everything. For example, metals often exceed what you would find in a cigarette smoke. Um, and, and the reason for that is often attributed to all the metal components in an e-cigarette. You've got soldering joints, you've got a heating filament. Those are going to leach metal ions. Also, depending on your puffing profile, um, there's a, a couple studies showing that if you crank up the voltage on your device, you can exceed formaldehyde, for example, can be orders of magnitude higher in an e-cigarette than what it would be in a cigarette. Um, also, other puffing profiles. Longer puffs tend to be more toxic than shorter puffs. That heating element continues to heat up. So the longer puff is, the second half of that puff is going to produce more toxins than the, the first half. Um, so there, there's a variety of, of, of these studies. Um, also, as I mentioned, there are thousands and thousands of different flavors, and each of those flavoring agents have different toxicities. In fact, those, those agents can be quite toxic. Cinnamon, for example, is one of the most toxic flavors. There are a large number of in vitro studies, none of which I have time to cover today, but there are a large number of in vitro studies showing variations in toxicity based on uh, uh, ingredients within the liquids. Here's another study that says the same thing as the last slide, that if you look at a variety of toxins that are associated with tobacco smoke, and these are carcinogens, formaldehyde's a carcinogen, acrolein, NNK, NNN, these are nitrosamines, these are all carcinogens, they're all there, um, but relative to cigarette smoke, they're all one to two orders of magnitude lower in concentration. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, it's one thing to say that they're lower in concentration in the vapors, but what about in the, in the users? Is there any indication that this translates, that you can connect that dot from the vapors to the user? So if you focus on acrolein, for example, which according to this study is uh, 15 times less concentrated than in cigarette smoke, uh, if, if you keep that in mind and we look at this study, this is a study in which they took a group of smokers and gave them e-cigarettes for four weeks, some of whom completely completely switched over to e-cigarettes. That's this abstinent group here. But others continued to use both. Um, but regardless, after four weeks, they measured a handful of things. Their exhaled carbon monoxide levels, which went way down, which you would expect. Carbon monoxide is either trace levels or absent in e-cigarette vapor. Their urinary cotinine. So cotinine is a metabolite of nicotine. So their nicotine levels stay more or less the same, which you would expect if they're using an e-cigarette. However, this is a metabolite of acrolein, which again reduced by about 80%. So this, it, it's logical that if there's lower concentrations in the vapors that you would detect it, but this connects the dots to show that those internal dose biomarkers, at least for this example in the case of acrolein, which is a carcinogen, is reduced uh, as, a, as a result of switching to e-cigarette use. But are there toxic effects, is there a pulmonary response associated with, with e-cigarette use? So this is a study on the left that I led, published a year ago, where we exposed mice to e-cigarette vapors or air for two weeks, three hours a day. And at the end of that, we looked at pulmonary responses. We could see modest increases in inflammatory cell counts in the lungs, macrophages specifically, as well as an increase in oxidative damage in the lungs, modest effects. Um, and then that's not necessarily contrasted, but uh, there's a more recent study showing, again, they also showed some immunological changes. They saw changes in, in cytokine levels. They saw other immune parameters changing um, that, that mimicked this study. But uh, total cellularity, total number of inflammatory cells in this case did not significantly change. So I think if you put these two studies side by side, what you can say is that both of them reported pulmonary, adverse pulmonary events, but depending on the duration, the, the intensity, um, those, those effects uh, can be, you know, uh, more or less, uh, can be you know, modified based on the intensity. One of the criticisms that I received, particularly, for example, from Public Health England, is that uh, 
I didn't put this uh, study in context of cigarette smoke. I only presented effects of e-cigarettes. And that's morally wrong. I have a moral obligation to present this in the context of cigarette smoke. This is only an issue for smokers, and if I present harmful effects of e-cigarettes without putting it in the context of cigarette smoke, I'm doing a disservice, I'm, I'm fear-mongering, basically, and, uh, and, and, that, and I was, my study and one other was largely blamed for painting a false narrative that, that uh, e-cigarettes are harmful, which is an incorrect narrative according to Public Health England. But there is a recent study that did make this comparison. Um, and so this is, again, a mouse study that exposed mice to either cigarette smoke or e-cigarette vapors six hours a day for three days. They reported a variety of pulmonary of, uh, effects, such as this is fluid in the lungs, so edema, basically. E-cigarettes resulted in a significant increase, but not to the level that was seen in cigarette smoke exposure. Similarly, inflammatory cytokines, again, IL-6, for example, significant increase with e-cigarettes, higher increase with cigarettes. They looked at oxidative stress, if they looked at cell death, similar things. There's mild increases over here with e-cigarettes, but clearly not to the effects that were seen with, e with cigarette smoke. So this kind of responded to that criticism that I received um, and showing that, that, yes, there is some pulmonary toxicity, but perhaps not to the extent of in cigarette smoke. What about in users, per uh, particularly in smokers who have switched? or continue to use both. As I mentioned, we're currently wrapping up a study that we did going into vape shops, surveying individuals, and we asked them, both the former smokers and the current smokers in the study, did you have any perceived health changes as a result of e-cigarette use? Former smokers overwhelmingly said yes. Current smokers, still the majority of them said yes. When we broke it down specifically among different symptoms that you may have, which ones are getting better, Again, across the board, all of the respiratory symptoms seem to improve, at least from, from their own uh, uh, perception. We also gave them the opportunity to write in a response, kind of a free-form letter, and we got many responses like this, where uh, you know, it, the world is now rainbows and butterflies thanks to e-cigarettes, um, and, and definitely a life changer for me for many different reasons. We, and, and as someone who's published uh, a study and my, my email is out there. I get emails all the time from very avid users who uh, condemn me for, for doing such a disservice to the world and tell them how much better they feel. And I can't discount that, that they're, they're lying. I think they're probably telling the truth. Um, so at least from, from a perception standpoint, there seem to be clear anecdotal health uh, improvements for switching. Is there any data specific data for health effects that might support that? And the answer is yes, at least in this study, uh, which is a susceptible population, these are individuals who are all asthmatics. It's a small study, just 18 individuals. These are all smoking asthmatics who are looking to quit smoking. And so they're provided a, an e-cigarette, and they either, some of them either switched entirely to e-cigarettes, others reduced their, e their cigarette consumption dramatically, but still maintained some dual use. But regardless, compared to the baseline, at the one year follow-up, they all reported the first three are various measures of lung function. They all significantly improved their lung function. Uh, ACQ's asthma control score, that significantly improved. PC20 is their airway hyper-responsiveness, so asthmatics have hyper-responsive restrictive airways, those scores or, or uh, doses of, of levels of constriction improved. Um, and so, again, this kind of suggests that at least in this population, switching from smoking to e-cigarette had some significant benefits over the course of a year. And so, so far, I've kind of shown that, in my opinion, it seems that there is some level of harm reduction for switching from cigarettes to e-cigarettes. Also, the mouse studies, the one that we did included, does point to some, some harm that can be caused by e-cigarettes. So they, they're clearly not harmless, um, perhaps not to the level of cigarettes. Although that's, that's setting a low bar. Cigarettes are pretty bad for you, so that's not saying all that much. Um, but are there effects in humans associated with e-cigarette use? And there are a few studies. For example, there's some extremely acute responses, such as if you 
give someone an e-cigarette for five minutes and have them vape away, you do see some changes in their respiratory resistance, for example, um, some adverse effects that might be comparable to what you would find in a, in a smoke, after a cigarette. Um, how about a little bit longer? This is still an acute study, and it's kind of complicated, so I'll just, just bear with me. There are two, two arms to this study. The first group were active smokers, cigarette smokers, who were given either two cigarettes or uh, an e-cigarette and asked to smoke away for, for 30 minutes. And what they measured on the left column is a bunch of indicators of lung function. Um, and then on the right side, they took a bunch of non-smokers and they placed them in a chamber, an exposure chamber, and they pumped in secondhand cigarette smoke or e-cigarette vapor for 60 minutes. And so this is a confusing graph, and oftentimes the error bars seem higher than, than the differences, but I'll tell you what they concluded. They concluded that uh, over here your, is serum cotinine levels. So again, uh, what they conclude is that whether, regardless of whether you are directly smoking tobacco or directly vaping an e-cigarette or if you're passively exposed to cigarette or e-cigarette, your serum cotinine levels are going up. So you're getting exposed. You're getting nicotine in your blood. As far as lung function, they focused on this one indicator of lung function and showed that, that out of all of these only direct cigarette smoke resulted in a significant, statistically significant decline in lung function. And so they concluded that, that cigarette smoking is the only one that was harmful for you. But I think it's important to note that direct e-cigarette vaping still resulted in a 3% drop in lung function. And this is immediately after that 30 minute, as did 60 minutes of passive smoking or vaping. So, you know, I, I think it's I don't think you can discount these 3% drops in lung function across the board. And so, again, I think it kind of, again, points to the same narrative that I've been saying, that the evidence suggests that there is some damage, there are uh, some acute toxic effects, perhaps not to the level of cigarette smoking. Is there anything to point to chronic effects? These are all 30, 65 minutes. There is one study that does show some chronic effects. This is, again, a very recent study. Um, which was from Hong Kong, in which they surveyed 45,000 adolescents. They asked them of their cigarette smoke status, their recent e-cig use, as well as chronic respiratory symptoms. And what they concluded is that across all of these teenagers, that if you had used an e-cigarette, you were 28% more likely to report chronic respiratory symptoms. Those effects were strongest among never smokers, um, they were not significantly altered in current smokers or experimenters, but if you were a never smoker, an ever smoker, or an ex-smoker, also using e-cigarettes, you saw increased chronic respiratory symptoms. There are some limitations to this study that I'll mention. One is that nicotine-containing e-cigarettes are banned in Hong Kong, and as a result, uh, they're, they're not very popular. Uh, I would assume then that these guys are all vaping on e-cigarettes that do not contain nicotine, although you could probably get them on the internet. But the other thing is that only 1.1% of all of these respondents reported recent e-cig use. Only 0.1% of the never smokers reported e recent e-cig use. So at first glance, these numbers look pretty striking, 37,000 never smokers. But when you think about only 0.1% of them had recently used an e-cigarette, you're talking about 37 individuals. So uh, and of those 37 individuals, they were more likely to report chronic respiratory symptoms. So it is what it is. You know, it's a significant increase, but maybe not as large of a study as, as uh, it might seem at first glance. So uh, running out of, uh, almost out of uh, uh, time, but um, this is the study, again, that, that I uh, published last year with Sean Biswell and several others. And I already showed that this data here, panel one, where we exposed mice for two weeks to either air or e-cigarette and saw some pulmonary changes. But the more interesting part of the study, in my opinion, was that we did a second experiment where we followed up this exposure with an intranasal infection with bacteria, streptococcus pneumoniae, and looked to see at how those mice responded to that bacterial infection. What we saw is that the mice were less able to clear the bacteria from either their airways or their lungs if they had been previously exposed to e-cigarettes. 
if we pulled out the inflammatory cells from these mice, we saw that, that the e-cig exposed mice were less able to take up or phagocytose the bacteria uh, compared to the macrophages from the mice that were not exposed to e-cigarettes. We, we did a third experiment where we followed up again this air e-cig exposure for two weeks by giving mice a viral infection, influenza virus, and uh, at that point we stopped the exposure and then just followed them for two weeks. And what we saw, we, so first in the middle here we looked at weight, we saw that they started to lose weight, they started to get sick around day four after the infection, and so at that point we sacrificed a subset of the animals and looked at the viral titers. We saw significant increases in viral titer in the lungs at day four. We then followed the mice an additional uh, up to two weeks, and we saw all the mice, their sickness peaked around day nine, and then as the mice started to recover, we saw the, the, the groups really separate quite nicely that the mice that had been previously exposed to e-cigarettes up to this point uh, had delayed recovery. They were more likely to die. Uh, we followed this up by a higher viral titer and again saw the same thing, that the mice that were exposed to e-cigarettes were twice as likely to die as those mice that were exposed to air. So these effects point to um, fairly clear effects on the immune response. Uh, and, and we didn't do a direct comparison, but effects that to me seem comparable to what we've, we've seen in the past with cigarette smoke. The criticism to this study though, again by Public Health England and others, is this is an animal study. It's irrelevant. Uh, this hasn't been shown in, in humans, and they're right. Um, and however, I will point out that this is a, a very, it's, it's not a published study. This was presented at the AAS conference just a couple days ago. Um, and this is Alona Jaspers who presented this data where they took nasal scrapings from either non-smokers, cigarette smokers, and e-cig users and characterized expression of approximately 700, 600 immune genes. And so their key finding that she's reporting is that e-cig users showed the same changes in immune genes as cigarette smokers. However, e-cig users also demonstrated suppression of several additional immune genes suggesting even broader suppressive effects on respiratory mucosal immune responses. So this data, uh, it's, as I said, it's unpublished, but uh, could suggest that this isn't just a quirk of the mouse or an artifact of our irrelevant exposure. One last thing to consider also is that um, not only do we have to concern ourselves about the effects of e-cigarettes on our host immune cells, but this study, uh, which I've alluded to previously, um, this study also exposed bacteria directly to e-cigarettes. In this case, they exposed MRSA, and they exposed it directly to e-cigarette vapors. And what they saw is that the e-cigarette vapors caused the bacteria to become more virulent. The bacteria was more adherent, it was more invasive, it was more resistant to antimicrobial peptides. If you took those exposed bacteria, infected them into mice, the, one, the bacteria that had been exposed to MRSA were more lethal, had higher burdens of bacteria in the lungs. So we not only have to concern ourselves with, with the effects that e-cigarettes have on our host immune cells, but also on the, the effects that it has on the colonizing bacteria of our mucosal surfaces. So last couple points, just very briefly. I just thought I'd touch on, is nicotine a carcinogen? Uh, and I think the answer is probably no. In vitro, at least, nicotine has been shown to have tumorigenic effects, meaning it's, it can increase cell proliferation, angiogenesis, it can reduce cell death, but there are, are no reproducible human or animal studies that I'm aware of that, that show that, that nicotine is a carcinogen. However, that's not to say that it's harmless. At concentrations equivalent to what you would find in cigarette smoke or e-cigarettes, nicotine has wide-ranging effects on numerous organ systems, on the immune system, uh, in fact, many of the responses that we saw in that e-cigarette study might be attributed to nicotine alone. I don't know that yet, but, but some preliminary data might suggest that at least some of it's contributed by nicotine. Um, fetal development, adverse birth outcomes, reproductive health, brain function, cardiovascular function, nicotine can alter blood pressure, can alter heart rate. The stance by the World Health Organization is, uh, in response to what, what many people will say, is, of course, nicotine is, is not harmful. Otherwise, the FDA wouldn't allow you to put it in the gum or, or on the patch. So clearly, it can't be harmful. The response that the WHO has is that 
yes, nicotine as a, as a public health option is okay, but recreational use is not. One last thing regarding nicotine is it, it is extremely toxic by ingestion. Um, so calls to poison control centers are skyrocketing. This is 2014 here, 4,000 calls to poison control thanks to e-cigarettes. There are two deaths that have been reported as a result of e-liquid ingestion. One was a toddler from New York uh, who was in his mother's care, but uh, she kind of turned around and saw him with a bottle of nicotine or e-cigarette liquid in, a, in the boy's hand. She immediately took him over to the neighbor's house who was an EMT, and there he started going into cardiac arrest and, uh, and unfortunately died. There was also few months ago, a British man who committed suicide by drinking liquid nicotine. So it's extremely toxic. We're not talking gallon levels. We're talking teaspoon levels of, of these liquids can be toxic and, and lethal. And lastly, what about this notion that e-cigarettes can explode? Um, it turns out that there's a good deal of credibility behind this. Um, there was a report that came out a year and a half ago by the U.S. Fire Administration stating where they described 25 incidents of of fires in the, uh, in the media. There's no 911 call checklist to say that this is an e-cigarette related call, so they largely just had to go through popular media to find these. But what they concluded is that the majority of these incidents occur while the e-cigarette is charging. Um, those, those chargers, they all look the same, but they're not the same, and they all deliver different currents, and, um, and mixing and matching can be pretty dangerous. Uh, but additionally, there are a handful of cases where they've happened in use. There, they also, the, this fire administration report also reported, there, the failure is always due to the battery. Um, as a result, the, the UK has also reported, or at least BBC reported through uh, Freedom of Information Act, that UK fire services had responded to approximately 100 calls over the past two years related to e-cigarettes. And a few months ago, the FAA banned e-cigarettes from, from their planes. And so these are some in, uh, just headlines that I pulled off of the web mostly. Um, but you can see, and, and just about all of these are within the past few months. There is one death that's been attributed to an exploding e-cigarette. The caveat to that was that this man was on oxygen therapy and his e-cigarette exploded a nearby oxygen tank. Um, but uh, these e-cigarettes in pockets can do tremendous damage to limbs. Uh, oftentimes, if they come in contact with your keys or your or change, they can kind of short circuit. Um, and, and several cases that have been reported in the media, you can see that um, one man placed in a coma, it's responsible for a broken neck, lost teeth, and highway accident. And these are just the ones that make headline nationwide news. For every one of these, there's probably a dozen of them that that don't make the, uh, the headlines, and probably for every one of those, there's probably several that don't even warrant a 911 call, just singe the carpet or something. Um, so, the, you know, the truth is that yes, these do explode quite frequently. Um, so, I'm coming to, to an end now. Um, so I hope that I've just kind of presented an overview that gives you enough evidence to, to make your own conclusions about these different points. And very briefly, Sean Biswal asked me to make a quick plug for a study that we're just getting underway with. Um, this is uh, based on some published data showing that the oral microbiome of, e or of cigarette smokers differs significantly from that of non-smokers. E uh, cigarette smokers, their oral microbiome tends to be more anaerobic bacteria, more pathogenic bacteria that may predispose them to periodontal disease and other types of, of systemic diseases. So we received funding just recently from the National Institute of Craniofacial and Dental Research to do a longitudinal study on the oral microbiome of, of e-cigarette users. And the reason why Sham asked me to make this plug is that we're, we're interested in leveraging this study for other purposes. Uh, and so if anybody is interested in helping us to perhaps measure lung function, cardiovascular uh, biomarkers, uh, anything like that, uh, let Sham or, or me know, and we'd be interested in, in trying to bolster this, this study. So with that, I'll end.
much, Tom, for the overview, you know, the balanced overview. <laughs> so, um, as an epidemiologist, my question would be about what the comparison group ought to be. And we had a question, a follow-up question from Byron Rogers, again from Nova Scotia. And um, he asks, um, smokers engaging in dual use, both cigarettes and e-cigs, should they be considered to be reducing harm compared to smoking only cigarettes? So, you know, it's all in the comparison group. And basically, it comes back to your scientific question, right? Yeah, I think there's no consensus on what e-cigarette alone does. And, and so... There are some people that say that even if you can reduce a little bit by dual use, that that's a benefit. The, the other people say that you're now creating an even larger cocktail of chemicals that are all interacting, and, and who knows what that combination and interactions are going to cause. So it, it, there's, there's no consensus on what e-cigarettes alone are doing. There's, there's even less consensus on this concept of is dual use beneficial. The data that I present so far seems to suggest that dual use is probably better than just exclusive cigarette smoking, but um, but no public health institution outside of public health England will make will say that. Okay. So do we have questions from the hall? Ms. Uh, Nicole has a, a microphone. I have a mic over side, here. Any questions? Please. I'll, I'll come to you, Anna. Thanks for that, Tom. Very interesting. So I very briefly, and it's on the same theme that, that this other question, but I think as public health professionals, we should, we, and we have a moral obligation as opposed to what New, New England, whatever, you know, the, the, <laughs> the British are saying, to look at non-smokers or people that have never used these devices and a comparison to clean air. And I totally disagree with other people that are criticizing these because you should only compare to cigarette smoke. That's not true because there's a lot of non-smokers that are now vaping. Yeah, to, to add on to that, even in those, those studies that I presented showing acute effects of e-cigarette use, those were all among smokers. For IRB reasons, I assume they're, they're not getting naive users to try an e-cigarette for the first time in their lab. Um, so they're taking people who are smokers and consenting them only. So. There's very limited data on, on just the effects of e-cigarettes, truly e-cigarettes alone in a, in a normal, never-smoking population. Other questions here? Rex? To I'll, I'll yell out in the back. Hopefully I have a big mouth and nobody can hear me. Sorry I came in late. But even, I have to confess, as a pulmonologist, this is such a new area that it's like, man, I'm ignorant about the e-cigarettes. On the other hand, moving into the current era, of the so-called quantified self, the fact that this is E, the electronic part, would it be actually an uh, opportunity to be able to really accurately track you know, everything from the frequency of use, the time that you use in the day, which is always important how to get them to quit, to you know, how many puffs did you take? <laughs> That's a, I, I, I'm not aware of any chip that's embedded into those that, that it certainly seems feasible. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty cool idea, um, but I think you're ahead of the game. Um, so I, nothing that I'm aware of. There that's is, not to say that they don't bring people in to labs and, and measure the puff profiles and um, the puff profiles certainly differ between e-cig users and smokers. Puff uh, e-cig users tend to take longer puffs, um, but as far as technology that that would do that, just automatically streaming to your computer, that that doesn't exist. Paul. Uh, yeah, Tom. I was just thinking about some of the problems, some of the questions you're asking. It seems to me could be answered by using uh, nicotine-based gum. Uh, it would help you answer questions about is it nicotine alone harmful? Is the nicotine alone going to cause you to go on to tobacco use? Um, and even in your table there, we had a very early table of about 10 different mm. instruments of, of torture. Uh, you didn't have nicotine gum on there. I was curious as to whether that's increasing, decreasing, how that influences 
what happens to people who smoke. Yeah, I, I have I have really nothing to add to that. Um, that that was a CDC report uh, where they documented, and so the, those were all among high schoolers. So in that case, you know, nicotine gum is probably not a a, a big issue, but. Uh, um, I, I really don't have much to add on, on the contribution of the nicotine gum. Um, what most studies say is that as far as smoking cessation, that the, the gum and the e-cigarette are modest, more or less the same. There might be some modest improvements. Very few studies compared the gum versus an e-cigarette. Most That meta-analysis was all e-cigarette versus no aid. There are very few studies that compare e-cigarette versus the gum or the patch. Uh, there's one big study in the Lancet, a couple of years old now, that that saw that there was a marginal difference, maybe a couple percent difference between using the, I think it was the patch, versus a, a nicotine-containing e-cigarette. Um, so acknowledging the the risks that we know exist with e-cigarettes. Um, I wanted to speak about harm reduction and get your insights on messaging that we can use related to e-cigarette injuries. Um, and then also, you mentioned that longer puffs were more dangerous than shorter puffs. So maybe, uh, you know, in, any messaging you might recommend based on that. I, I think as far as messaging goes, I think what's logical to, to do is to try and maybe increase the, the message towards the cigarette smokers. Um, and so I, I think using themes of sex and things like that and, and other things in their ads I think is pretty irresponsible. I, I think um, the, the goal should be that you maximize the effectiveness for smokers and minimize those teenagers who are going to be starting using them for no no reason whatsoever. What, you know, you could argue that there is some kind of benefit to a smoker switching. There's nothing that can be gained from a 15-year-old using an e-cigarette. So I think I think the message should be trying to tailor it away from from the non-smokers, the you know the people who stand to be harmed by this, and perhaps limiting the advertising to people who are going to smoking cessation clinics or pulmonary clinics um, limit uh, advertising to, say, a registry of, of confirmed smokers, not, not advertising on the back of Maxim magazine or something like that. I think that's inappropriate. Tom, thanks. We have, we'll have one more question, um, but I wanted to make sure the audience in-house knows there's pizza available immediately following this talk. It's down in the gallery. so. When you come in the Monument Street entrance, there's a screen in front of you. Just go to that area with your red ticket from Nicole. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned a lot of the different flavors and kind of how it's advertising. And one of the benefits of doing this type of research is in, the, in the lab is that you're assured that the e-cigarettes are actually the same thing versus when you're doing this in people, there's so many different flavors, some of these different combinations, and some of them are even being made in-house at the vape shops. So how can we accurately study, let alone regulate e-cigarettes when we're not even sure if we're comparing the same groups of people? Yeah, that's been an argument. Is there a reference e-cigarette? And the answer is no. Um, I think there have been some meetings inside the NIH to talk about that and even propose studies that might develop a reference e-cigarette. That, that exists for cigarette smoke studies. There are reference cigarettes. Um, but it really, it's really hard to say. And, um, it, you know, there's such, such an array of flavors that Unless the FDA steps in and, and dramatically reduces the number of flavors, I think you've just got to uh, kind of incorporate as many as you can. Um, there, you have the ability to, to study the effects. There are nicotine containing and nicotine absent. Um, there are studies that look at uh, the propylene glycol to glycerin mix. Some can be all propylene glycol. Others can be a mix or 75, 25, 50, 50, 25, 75. Do those impact health? Um, a variety of studies, mostly in vitro studies, looking at 30, 40 different flavors and reporting just laundry lists of LC50 uh, values. You know, so there, it's really all over the place. 
and there, there is no consensus at this point. So it's gonna be a challenge. So I, I see Miranda's here in the audience. <laughs> um, you might know about the prevalence of cigarette smoking by age. So e-cigarettes affect young, young smokers, and especially when we look at adults, those up to age 34. Um, but has that changed, the distribution of smokers by age? Has that changed since the e-cigarette era? do you currently smoke cigarettes? And as we've seen that, a lot of these people who use the e-cigarettes don't consider themselves as smokers. So they're actually being missed and being counted as never smokers. But that's the concern with all these kind of new flavors that have been banned in cigarettes that now they're being picked up among these e-cigarette, in these e-cigarettes and these bubblegum flavors and all these type of flavors that are more attractive to uh, younger adolescents. And so that's really the concern is now you're just gonna have a whole new generation of e-cigarette users who would have never picked up a cigarette. 